now, 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 we're working again uh, on uh, Laodicea. We, we didn't deal with any of that on Sunday. Uh, Sunday, uh, we were led a different way, and the Lord just moved in a mighty way, I believe. Uh, I can't speak for how you were blessed, but God certainly did bless uh, me in a very special way. And I honor him, and I thank him for that, and I just believe that he's going to take us higher and he's going to take us even to the level that we never knew we could go to, and that's always God. I said to the late Bishop Arthur Brazier, did he ever know that he would have achieved as much as he did? And he said, no. I said, that is a sign then that God was the one who was operating in your life. If you can dream it, plan it, execute it, achieve it, then you're doing it yourself. But when it's beyond what you can achieve, then very certainly it is God and God all by himself. I told a good friend of mine once, never believe what you have received is something you have achieved. Uh, don't get it confused. Don't get the big head. Don't lose your humility because whatever it is that you have it is received. It is something God has given his anointing, his blessing, his strength he has given. And you execute within the parameters of what he has given. And it will achieve what he wants done in the world. Now, with that in mind, we're going to roll back into the book of Revelations. And we went across, if you remember, we dealt uh, very briefly with each church situation leading us to Philadelphia and then on to Laodicea. Now, it's important because I have discovered that whenever God is operating and whenever he wants to slow the time down, he always interjects something extremely positive that can only come from God when man is on a downhill slide. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can make that even more clear. Once Adam fell, once sin came into the world, then mankind immediately was on a decline was on a decline because the first man in the garden rebelled against God and that disobedience was rebellion. There's no other way to put it. Eve was deceived. Adam chose to do what he did without being deceived. He just chose a woman over God. And uh, that's what he did, essentially. And he disobeyed God and uh, uh, the gospel writers and the New Testament writers call it rebellion, man rebelled. If you notice, immediately upon the fall, now we end up with murder in the first family. And we end up with murder, and by Genesis chapter 6, it is so dreadful that the thoughts of man was only evil and no, every imagination was only evil continually. Now just get the scope of that in your mind, Genesis chapter 6, that every thought was only evil continually. Every only continually. Now, that means by Genesis chapter 6, God is sick of the world and repented God that he made man. That is simply to show how sick he was of the world by Genesis chapter 6. So in order to get to Revelations, God has to slow the process of decimation that man is bringing on himself. And in order to do that, he interjected human government, he interjected conscience, dispensation of conscience, then human government, then he interjected law, and then he interjected grace. So he has to interject spiritual things that can only come from him 
in order to slow the decimation that was wasting man by Genesis chapter 6. Now we've got the rest of the Bible. We got to get to Revelation. So how do we get to Revelation? By God stepping into the circumstances of man and slowing the process of degradation, dilapidation, decimation, and if you have anything else that begins with DE, I will gladly take it, depreciation. Uh huh. So God has to interject in order to slow the process down. Now, that becomes critical when we look at the churches, the seven churches, and we understand, and we went through each one of them and the difficulties that each one of them had. And as we looked at the difficulties each one of them had, we found that there was and is a decline even in the church, the visible church. Now, you got to understand that in every visible church, there is the real church. So he's giving us the view, the overall view of the visible church in each one of those eras, in each one of those times. Thank you. In each one of those times, he's dealing with the visible church. But, in each one of the presentations, you hear him saying something that's very subtle, that everyone who is in the real church is going to hear. He that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So, you have to come to the conclusion that in the visible church, in all of our churches, you have a condition that exists that is anti-God and against his word in every one of the churches. So he speaks to the church in order to correct, in order to bring conviction. He brings his word to bear upon the church, to show what their problems are, and to give a solution to their problems. But he realizes and he understands that everybody in the visible church is not going to respond because the wheat and the tares grow together. Who will respond? He that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Very significant. So don't be dismayed over the overall condition of the church. Don't, don't be dismayed. Don't at all be dismayed. Just make sure that you have an ear to hear what God is saying to the church right now. Because everybody in the house does not have an ear to hear. And so don't be dismayed. Just keep listening to God and you keep responding to God. Don't look around and get all carried away with what the masses are doing in the church. You just hold on to the truth and lay hold to those things that are pleasing in his sight because he said the wheat and the tears are going to grow together. And it is essential then for you to keep your hands off, making judgments, criticizing people, putting people down. Your job, if you're truly within the parameters of his truth, and if you have an ear to hear, what you're going to do is you're going to be loving and kind and gentle. You're going to be long-suffering and patient. You're going to do, you're going to have love, and you're going to do those things to everybody that a child of God would do who is operating according to the Spirit of God and who has an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the church. So what I want to do today is spend a little time on Philadelphia because Philadelphia, in my eyesight, is that church period, that church period that slowed that's right here, that he would put a favored church right after the dead church. So that's what I want to do. I want to talk a little bit about Philadelphia 
and the significance of Philadelphia and the early part of the 20th century that introduced the power of the Holy Spirit, the whole issue of brotherly love, and all of the things that Philadelphia did to give us and to bring us where we are. So, let us run quickly to Revelations 3, 7, and 9. And uh, I'll read it if we can't get it on the board quick enough. Uh, I'll be glad to read it. And, and uh, cause I wanna show a little bit about how we got to where we are and why we are where we are right now in a church in this situation. Thank you. So what we have is, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things say it, he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. All right, that's seven. Eight, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. All right, let's go further, because it sounds real apostolic to me. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. Now, it's critical to, to see, and if you go back a little bit, go back to eight, if you will. And uh, now, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word and has not denied my name. Now this leads us into what I might call, what we call from a denominational standpoint, apostolic. And the apostolic, which I guess we fall under the, the umbrella of what we call apostolic. The apostolics from a denominational standpoint. Now, I have to emphasize that because anything apostolic is all New Testament. The whole New Testament is apostolic. The apostles presented Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Redemption, propitiation, sanctification, uh, atonement, adoption. All of that is apostolic presentation of Jesus Christ to all of us. But the denomination apostolic is centered around the use of the name of Jesus in baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. That's the denomination apostolic. When you say he's apostolic, he's Jesus name oriented. He is believing that baptism should be in the name of Jesus. He is believing that you call on the name of Jesus and you receive the Holy Spirit speaking in other tongues and that is branded apostolic. Of course, the, uh, over the years, the traditions of the apostolic church has changed. Uh, used to be no pants, no TV, uh, no going out, no nothing. But now everybody parties, everybody wears pants, everybody, hey. But we still hold fast to the name of Jesus in baptism. We still hold fast to receiving the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues as an initial sign. And then of course, all of the behavior that comes through the Holy Spirit is indicative of the fact that you have received it. You can fake the tongues, but you can't fake the behavior. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, I, I had to throw that in. Now, when we understand that, we see what's happening in Philadelphia. You see, because there is no question about the meaning of the word Philadelphia, it simply means brotherly love. And it describes, if I can take my time, the charity and the brotherly fellowship that dissipated the bitter personal animosities of Sardis. God had to interject something in what we now describe as the latter rain. 
And if you go to Joel, there's an early rain, there's a latter rain. It has been interpreted that the early rain was at Pentecost. And the latter rain was the turn of the century when Seymour was right here in Azusa Street. And in LA, right here down at Azusa Street, Seymour, the one-eyed black uh, preacher, and people came from all over the world to receive the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. And since then, Pentecostalism, glossolalia, has taken over every denomination. You can go into a Baptist church that used to be sedity and stiff about people speaking in tongues and dancing and running around. And, and they fall out all over the place now. You can go CME, you can go AME, you can go to the Catholics, you can go anywhere. And you see that Pentecostalism has completely taken over the whole church world. From all over the world, people are speaking in other tongues, dancing and shouting and running from one side of the church to the other. you got to watch out. Uh, some running in the spirit, some running without the spirit. Uh, those running in the spirit won't knock you over. But those, those who are running to be running, you, <laughs> you better make a discernment and make a move. The point I'm making is that when the Holy Spirit came to Azusa Street or, and the outpouring, which really started in Kansas in a school there, but we won't go into that detail, it just changed the face of Christianity. All of what Sardis brought in its theological disputants and much of the negatives of the Sardis period was changed by Philadelphia because when people were speaking in other tongues and the Holy Ghost was falling everywhere on everybody, one thing you have to understand, the Holy Spirit is the single greatest unifier in all the world. The Holy Spirit, if there is no unity in the Holy Spirit, if an individual claims to be filled with the Holy Ghost and they are divisive, they are judgmental and mean, they are truce breakers, not only that, but they separate best friends because of their negative conversation, then somebody does not have the Holy Spirit. God is so much one that when he fills you with his spirit, there is neither bond nor free. That's financial. Money doesn't make a difference. There is neither Greek nor Jew. That's racial. Race doesn't make a difference. And there's another one. There is neither male nor female. So there's no sexism. There's no racism. And there's no fiscal situation that separates people. When the Holy Ghost comes. So what does that do? When the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of love, comes and it's outpoured on multiple races, multiple financial levels, on men and women in the last days, your sons and daughters, when it flows like that, it introduces a season of brotherly love. I hope you see that. So whatever the decline, well, my God, Whatever the decline from the backslidden church to the persecuted church to the licentious church to the lax church to the dead church, whatever is needed. Do you see the progress? All the way until you get to the fifth and you got the dead church. It's over. It's over. Until he introduces the very substratum or the very platform on which all church stands. And what is that? Love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, by your love. 
not anything else but your love. So he has to reintroduce love, and six is the number of man. He reintroduces love to stop the decimation, the decline, the depreciation, the dilapidation, the decrepit attitude of man in church. See what I'm saying? You want revival in the city of refuge? Outpouring of the Holy Ghost, love. That's it. That's it. That will stop everything that's negative, that's flowing in any age, any era, any situation, any time when brotherly love. So, it made possible then the evangelistic and missionary labors for the last, might I say, 200 years. It was, and, and no end, 100, 100, where are we now? Uh, 19 to uh, 21. Yes, yes, yes. Once the Holy Ghost fell, and brothers and sisters from around the world, filled with the Holy Ghost and love begin to flow. The church then was solid. People like Charles Finney, Wesley, Charles Wesley, people like uh, Moody, uh, you go through people like, like Seymour, people like Haywood, Golda, people like Johnson, A1 Johnson, uh, people like Mason, uh, pe oh come on, people like, I mean, all, all over the place. Church was alive and well. Early 1900s, 1907, when the Holy Ghost fell and fell all the way through. Church was alive. Three things were said about the church. Uh, the Philadelphian church. Uh, you had a little strength. So it was like a person coming back to life who was still weak. So the dead Sardis church is now revived through the Philadelphian church. And, and, and for those of us who want to have revival, uh, this is the, the make for revival. You, you got to have revival, you got to revive. Uh, you have to have lived if you want to be revived. So revivals then have been the characteristic of the Philadelphian period. I didn't mention George Whitfield, uh, who followed by John Wesley. I mentioned him by Charles Finney, by D.L. Moody. By, and then you, got to, you can't leave out Seymour, and you can't leave out Mason, and you can't leave out Haywood. You, you can't leave these people out because they operated uh, in, in, in Mason operated uh, where they did not, they still baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But let's, let's argue that. Name singular of the Father. Name singular of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So what you have then is three revelatory expressions of one God who the three revelatory expressions have one name. That name cannot be Harold. That name cannot be Jennifer. That name can only be Jesus. Father has sent me in his name, I have come in my Father's name. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, shall save his people from sin. The Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name. So one name for the three revelatory expressions because Jesus, the Son, in the revelatory expression of the Son, is still the same God who is the revelatory expression of the Father, who is the revelatory expression of the Holy Ghost, is still the same God and the name. 
that is given among men whereby we must be saved is the name Jesus. So you can't throw Mason out and the Church of God in Christ people out because they baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost because what is that name? It's implied, Jesus. We go to Acts 2 and 38 and we don't imply the name, we explicate the name when we say in the name of Jesus. Are you with me? I hope you're following. So you can't sit here and send people to hell because they baptize in the name of the Father. I'm baptizing you in the name. What name? Of the Father. Jesus, I came my Father's name. Of the Son. Thou shalt call his name G Jesus. Uh, of the Holy Spirit. And the Father and the Son, the Spirit shall come in my name. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The name is Jesus. So, notice very carefully that all of these men promulgated the love and set that church on fire with revival. The second thing he said was that the church that he set before it an open door that no man could shut. And note the promise was made by him who hath the key of David. Is it, did we not read, read that? He had the key of David. So if he has the key, he opens and no man can shut. And when he shuts something, no man can open. In your life, in my life, it doesn't matter who wants to see you blessed or who doesn't want to see you blessed. When the Lord opens a door for you, nobody can shut it. You can't sit around blaming folk for what you haven't done. When God opens a door, I don't even argue anymore with people. I don't even fight about it. Uh, I, I, if I speak my testimony and somebody doesn't like it, I don't even answer. I don't even respond. Why? Because if God has orchestrated the circumstance and situation to the point where he opens a door, then there's absolutely nobody who can close the door that he opens. And when he shuts a door, <clears throat> there is nobody can open a door that God shut. And sometimes he shuts you in and to protect you. He locks you in. And the enemy wants to open that door to get to you. But he can't get in to harm you because God put you in a safe place and shut the door. And another wonderful thing about God is if he knows something is going to destroy you, he'll shut the door so you can't get in yourself. And no man, not even you, can open a door to harm yourself when God has closed the door to keep you safe. He closes doors to direct you. So that you head this way enthusiastically, you run into a door that you think is yours and all of a sudden it shuts in your face. Then you run to another shut and you shut and shut and all that is is shutting doors so you can find the right one. And the one that's open is the one he allows you to go in and you praise him for every one he closed. Oh yes. Now let me put it this way. Rejection is direction so stop looking at direction as if it's all over maintain your hope keep your hope keep expecting God to show you what and where you need to be in spite of your enthusiasm and your drive and many times we think our enthusiasm and our drive is the Lord no it's just you sometimes and your desires and your wishes and God says no I'm shutting that down and then you give him praise. Now the open door can be taken further here. And that is God opened the door for work to be done in countries like China, in countries like Japan, Korea, India, Africa, and even the isles in the sea. And until there is not a country in the world where the missionary can go. 
Now I'm, I'm, I'm writing a piece because some of my close friends want to bring two countries together. But sometimes people got to understand, people have to die sometimes for certain countries to come together. And if that's what God chooses to do, then you leave it up to him. Now, the third thing was, it was to be kept from the hour of temptation. Now, that's the, that's the Philadelphian church. Now, what is the hour of temptation here? And it, the hour of temptation that shall come upon all the world. Now, as the church at Philadelphia is still in existence, and the only one of the seven that has survived, and while it, and this is, we're talking the real church now, it suffered more or less under 10 persecutions of the Smyrna period. It has never yet suffered in a persecution that was worldwide. The church has never suffered in a worldwide persecution. There are certain places that people suffer. In certain nations, in certain countries, you got to be clandestine in your service, in your worship. And I'm telling the people now that in some of these countries where you're looking for national revival, you're not going to get it. You got to sneak in there and preach to those who want to be saved and save those people through the power of the Holy Ghost who want to be saved. But you ain't getting the whole nation. I'm telling you right now, we can't even get the whole nation here and we call it a Christian country. You got to get those, hear me, hear me? Well, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. Oh, I just lost my peace. Uh, I, I can go on. Notice now, when he's talking about saved from temptation, that great temptation, that's tribulation. So what he's proving to us here is that the church shall not pass through the tribulation. The church shall, not be, shall be caught out before the tribulation. So now, when we look at the period, that Philadelphian period covers right up until we run into Laodicea. Oh Lord, help me now. Help me, help me. And I'm here to tell you that based on what is going on in Laodicea that took away from Philadelphia things aren't going to get better. We're not going back to Philadelphia. He that hath an ear to hear. I'm talking to folk that want to be saved now. That's who I'm talking to. I'm talking to folk that being saved is primary in their lives. Touching other people's lives and helping other people to come to Christ is primary in their lives. Because I'm going to show you what happened. Jesus is now on the outside. As far as we see. He's outside. The church. I can go further to show you that. Now, how did he get outside? How did we move from Philadelphia to Laodicea, what it is that we have substituted for Jesus to the point where we put him outside. Something had to have taken his place. What possibly could have taken Jesus' place for him to be outside the church. Now, while we're in here shouting, well, if he's outside, who are we shouting about? While we're in here worshiping, well, if he's outside, who are we worshiping? Because didn't he say, behold, I stand at the door and knock? 
if he's outside, then who are we bragging about? I mean, if, if he's on the outside. We've got to give some consideration to this. Now, remember what I said earlier, and I'll say it again. There is the visible church, and there is the real church. Who constitutes the real church? He that hath an ear to hear, because everybody's not listening. Now, when Philadelphia came by, the favorite church, the church that we just described, the church that had the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that brought people together. What we ended up with 1907, 1906, 1907, around that time, what we ended up with is traditional Pentecost. Traditional Pentecostals focus so much on going to heaven until those of us baby boomers who were kids to them and grandkids, we had a hard time even getting to college. Do you remember when the Pentecostal church would not allow their kids to go to college because they said, y'all, come out from among them, be separate. And college was going to take the little God you had <laughs> right out of you. Uh, my step, not my step-grandfather, but my grand-uncle, he would say, well, you know, you know God initially, and God is in you from an innate point of view. You naturally come up knowing there's a God. You go to college, they're going to teach God right out of you. So they were struggling to allow even their children to go to college. They were so heaven bound, they were literally no earthly good because all of their whole conceptualization of God was we look up our redemption draw nigh, we live holy, we go to heaven, and this world is not our home. We don't deal with politics. We don't deal with nothing that relates to the world. That's how they stood. Now, traditional Pentecostalism gave way to neo-Pentecostalism because traditional Pentecostalism, everything was faith for heaven, for relationship with God. Then neo-Pentecostalism comes along and Neo-Pentecostalism was way more liberal, way more open, way more college-bound, way more things of the world-oriented Neo-Pentecostal. From Neo-Pentecostalism came Charismaticism, and Charismaticism operated now in a wide open, free, hardly any doctrine kind of situation that people enjoy. The traditional Pentecost was angry with the charismatic because what they said was they needed to come to us to get instruction as how to operate in the word of God, baptism, communion, and all the other things that related to that. Now, faith began to move from going to heaven to becoming more positive thinking for the individual here. From traditional Pentecostalism to neo-Pentecostalism to charismaticism, now we end up with word of faith. Health, wealth, and prosperity. The traditional Pentecostal was only heaven. The neo-Pentecostal to the charismatic was a little more balance. You need an education. You need a little money. Then we went to the other extreme word of faith where 
now faith. I wish, I wish we could reverse some of that lack of biblical understanding, some of that, I wish we could reverse some of that subjective theology that everybody just thought of something and threw it out there and if they had any influence, everybody would swallow it. Now faith. Now faith, they take the now and they make faith right here and now for financial prosperity, for money. Now faith. Not faith for heaven, not futuristic, not an expectation of the glory of God, not an expectation of things to come, not an expectation of an eternal salvation with the Lord. Now faith. When the Bible says now faith is the substance Hupostasis, the substance of things hoped for, the elikos, the conviction of things not seen. They weren't talking about anything earthly. Now, simply connected chapter 11 to chapter 10. It wasn't taking faith for spiritual connection to Jesus Christ and make it a connection to the things of the world. That is what, excuse me, uh, little girl, uh, that is what shifted us from Philadelphia to Laodicea. What took his place? Not the devil. The devil didn't took his place. Money took his place. The devil didn't take his place. Ain't nobody worshiping no devil up in here. Put Jesus out. It's all about we doing devil worship. We ain't doing that. We still cursing the Satan. We still talking bad about the devil. Yeah, we blaming the devil now for stuff that he ain't even done. We still all over the devil. <laughs> and we especially over the devil in our finance. Hey, you know, rebuke the devil off my finance. We, we need to rebuke the devil in more ways than just finance. The devil mess with my money, pray over my checkbook. Uh, you know, write on a checkbook, money cometh, and, and I'm going to be all right, and all that kind of stuff. No, you're not going to be all right if you don't manage it. Now, you're blaming the devil for mismanagement. Come on, children of God. The devil, the devil, the devil is not the issue here. What has to happen here, and what happened in Laodicea, is self-deceit. But self-deceit is predicated on the deceitfulness of riches. Notice, you said you, you're clothed. You said you were rich. You said you can see. And every time the Lord said, you need to buy gold tried in the fire. You need to come to me. The deceit is the deceitfulness of riches where Laodicea has put God out over money. I'm telling you, and this is why I'm closing on it today, but I'm saying he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. And that is with all of the substance that you have, and we probably have more than our predecessors ever had. But with all that we had, that is, we have, that is not a substitute for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he told me that I shouldn't labor for the meat that perisheth. I shouldn't be running after stuff that's not going to be around. What I need to run after is him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. Well, what shall be added? 
what was in the context. Food and raiment. Oh, I wish somebody would understand. He's not saying, seek me and I'll give you a Rolls Royce. If you get a Rolls Royce, you better have a plan. And you better have a financial situation going that can get you into a Rolls Royce. You're not just going to have a Rolls Royce because you dropped off $20 in the church. That's not going to happen. Are you all with me? Or, or, or am I by myself out there? I hope you're seeing what I'm saying here. It is love flowing in Philadelphia. The church was on fire. Folk were being saved everywhere. Now we're so in love with money and we preach it so adamantly and so powerfully that we don't even make an altar call anymore to call sinners to repentance around the world. After we finish preaching in our conventions, in our conferences, wherever we are, the first thing we do is call for a second offering. We got to meet the budget. We got to save some money. But the truth is God had never told us to save money. He told us to save souls. It is critical to see how the power of the Holy Ghost came, brotherly love came, Church of Philadelphia, and we moved from neo, from traditional to neo, to charismaticism, to word of faith. And now, after word of faith, people are now getting up saying, well, we didn't tell you the right thing. And when we were raising thousand dollar offerings, we weren't doing the right thing. Now all of a sudden, We weren't doing the right thing. Well, we've done it for 50, 60 years. And Jesus is saying, maybe somebody, maybe, uh, maybe I, I, won't, I won't fight that. Confess. Make the admission. Because maybe somebody now hath an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Because my Savior is saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm closing, but I don't want to close on a negative. I really don't. But we quote these words to sinners, but they're actually addressed to us, the city of refuge. Because this is the church that Jesus once stood in, the church. But now he finds himself excluded and standing outside, knocking to get in. So the most startling thing recorded in the New Testament, this is the most startling thing, and that it is possible for a church to be outwardly prosperous and yet don't have Jesus in the midst. And, 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 and here's worse. Here's the worst part. Here's the worst part. Outwardly prosperous, don't have Jesus in the midst, and don't know it. Now that's, that's, the, that's the crazy part, is he ain't in here, and we running around shouting and don't know it. Why? Because of what you're wearing? Because you got on some Gucci, which is overpriced? You got on some Pradas? I got some on. Uh, because you got on some clothes? Because you drove up in a, in, in, a, in a Bentley or Rolls? But you came to church. You didn't come to a fashion show. You came to church. Now, you didn't come to see what somebody else was wearing. You came to have a little talk with Jesus. But then you ride up all thinking that you're blessed because of what you have. And then you come into the church and he ain't here. No wonder the people are fighting. 
Now when the people mad and people look at you funny and people can't stand the person next to you and can't stand the person over there and there's no love going nowhere because the center of love is not in the house. Now can, can I just, I, I, I got a little record here. Uh, he was excluded from his own nation. He came unto his own and his own knew him not. Remember that? But as, as many as received him, to them gave he power. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Excluded from the world because they crucified him. Now he's excluded from his church and he's outside knocking to get in. Can we let him in? Can somebody let Jesus back in? And I'm talking to those who have an ear to hear because I heard him say, if any man, didn't he say that? He says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I extend this word as I conclude, to those of you who have an ear to hear and you have not, I know you have some nice things, you got, you got a marvelous job, corporate America, you got a marvelous job, you've got multiple degrees, you've got all kinds of doors opening for you in a mundane, passing world endeavor. I know that your stocks have come in. I know that you've made the right kind of investments, property, and all that kind of stuff. I know you're doing well. I know you're doing well. But do you still have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to you? And that is that he's outside. He's outside. All of your testimonies about your clothes, your house, your, your new house, the house you're building, the house you have in the islands, the house you have south of France, how you got in Paris, the condo in London. Good, 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 good. But is that really why you came to Jesus? Is that really why you get on your knees and pray? Is that all you ask him for, or is that relationship with him separate from that and more important than that? Well, if you have an ear to hear, I want you to call 844-267-7729 and say, I want, I, I'm knocking on the door. Knock on the door with me in prayer because I hear his voice and I want to let him back in. I, I, I bragged and talked too much about financial things. I've worried too much about financial things. Right now, I want him to come back and let me have those kinds of sessions with him in the middle of the night that bless me so well that nothing mattered around. 844-267-7729. Call that number. Somebody will answer. Somebody's waiting to pray with you so you can knock together. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. Every soul is precious around the world. Everyone listening to my voice. I pray now, Lord, that we will open the door. I hear you knocking. I hear you knocking. Let us rush to the door, Lord. We, we, we're rushing to the door to let you in. In all that we have, we still have these mental health issues in all that we have. We're killing each other, shooting little kids in schools and shooting folk who are running away. And the whole place is in trouble with all we have. We need you to come back in, that our worship will be real, that we will not just have a form of godliness, 
denying the power because we put him out. Come on in, Jesus. And we pray that you will. You will because you're knocking on the door, so it's up to us. We will open. And we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity. We thank you that you didn't just walk away. That you're knocking. And we will. In Jesus' name.